What's up, podcast world? We're back live in studio, another episode. This Life Ain't For Everybody, again, brought to you by our friends, our family, Lynchburg, Tennessee, Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey, Jack Daniels, enjoy it responsible, never allow underage drinking. Jack Daniels, thank you so much for the experience in Sturgis, South Dakota, the 2021 bike rally. I'm talking energy and passion and love and respect, a little bit of trouble going on up there, but all in all, we're going to do a couple podcast series coming up on This Life Ain't For Everybody with Alex Crosby. Y'all know the name of that one, Breaking It Down. We'll have those coming soon, but Sturgis is wild, man. They're saying like, the 81st rally this year beat the numbers of the 75th rally six years ago. They're talking like 800,000 bikes this year. Crazy, crazy amount of Americana going on. Thank you, Sturgis. Thank you, South Dakota. Thank you, Jack Daniels. Thank you all for downloading the podcast. Today, we got a pretty cool podcast coming at you. All have heard of our partnership with Chad Mendez and the Provider Life brand, all of our dry rubs, our upcoming cookbook in November of 2021. We are excited as heck about it. And today I have a friend and a business cohort named Patrick McKinney from Atlanta, and he works for the partnership company that we're in cahoots with, with our dry rub line from the provider. His company's called Life Spice. He takes care of outside sales and has been the mastermind behind the flavor profiles of our rub line. So we wanted to come together today on the podcast and talk about what it took to get here, how we went about coming up with the flavor profiles that we did for all 10 of our rubs. We're going to get into details about those rubs, what they're good on, what we prefer them on, whether it's beef, domestic, pork, chicken, lamb, whether it's wild game, your ducks, your geese, your turkeys, your deer, your elk, your buck buffalo, whatever you're cooking, we want to talk to you about all of your meats and we don't want to leave out the vegetables or the cocktails. Our cookbook is going to have three or four Jack Daniels cocktails in it for your enjoyment. So Patrick McKinney, welcome to the show, my man. How are you? I'm fantastic, Chad. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate your hospitality. Thanks for letting me crash at your pad and dinner last night was amazing. Did you really think it was amazing? Oh man, the uh, American almond beef uh, ribeyes that we had last night, fatty, juicy, just the sear marks on that thing, your grill, uh, it turned out to be amazing. Traegers are pretty rad, huh? They, oh, absolutely. That is a fantastic grill you got. I really enjoyed it. Do you, um, I mean, I didn't pay you to say American almond beef or almond beef is good. It's legit. It's legit good, huh? The burgers and it the It is steaks. legit good. It, I, I literally was just salivating over that last night. And I just, you know, I've got a lot of things going on in my mind as far as what I'd love to do with that beef. But, man... I just couldn't, but keep cutting. And that, that doesn't thing. come lightly from you because you're trained in culinary. You're a chef. You have a lot of experiment or a lot of experience, I should say, in the culinary arts, cooking for restaurants, for private entities. Um, so when you say that's good beef, you've you've done a lot of recipes with other beefs, and that one ma- matches up, huh? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I can't say enough about it. I mean. Yeah, I've been cooking since I was fifteen. Went to the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, long list of working at a lot of great restaurants um, and then doing some R&D research and development in my life, which led me to where I'm at now. But I'd have to say that was just spot on last night. I really enjoyed the beef that you had. And I think the way you feed, the way you take care of those cows, those are some happy cows before they become uh, a happy uh, plate. Yeah, the steers are amazing and they they live a good life. The the food blend that that Brandon and Tim and Rocky have come up with. I mean, it just they we finish them the last pretty much the last you know 120 days of their life, four months, and it's they eat that feed every day. They don't leave the feed lot, and it just finishes that meat with such a good texture and marbling and sweet buttery flavor. I mean, it's different. I mean, when people mm-hmm. eat it, they're not yes. going to stop eating it. The ground beef, the burgers are amazing. Um, you had one last night. The burgers are on a different level. Everybody we've cooked them for. But on that steak last night, I used the crosshairs on one side of it and then a tiny, tiny smidget of garlic salt on the other. But that crosshairs with, you know, it's a, a touch of deal in there. The The slogan mm-hmm. is the art of the deal, yep. D-I-L-L. And um, what is a dry rub? In your experience, a dry rub is obviously you can marinate meat. 
You can use seasoning salts, which are different than dry mm -hmm. rubs. Um, you can apply dry rubs in different formats. Some people like to go heavy, like on a brisket, I go pretty heavy and then top it with some black pepper, or maybe some coffee style rub from Whiskey Bent Barbecue or Traeger. But what is a dry rub? You're, you're massaging that flavor profile down into the textures of the meat and breaking down that meat, like a kind of like a tenderizing massage with your hands when you're rubbing it in. But what is a dry rub, Patrick? It is a lot different than a marinade. Where a marinade, you use a smaller granule size of salt and pepper and spices. Some things in there are water soluble, so then it's added with water and then it's vacuum sealed, tumble marinated with chicken or beef, pork, things like that to really penetrate into that product itself. But a dry rub, it is meant to be a heavy uh, grind size, lots of particulates. Um, it's, it's a heavy coating. Um, and then you're mainly dry cooking it sort of uh, whether it's a grill or a smoker and uh, as the juices come out of that protein it starts getting and interacting with the salt the pepper the flavors and really uh, has that rub attached to that meat and, and bring that flavor into it so when you start thinking about like what crosshairs is and it's starting to mix with the natural juices and liquids of that meat that's being produced there's no we're not spritzing it. We're not adding anything to that meat. We're not marinating it. So mm. there's no liquid in this. This is the natural juices. Yeah. We're not using, we did not use olive oil as a baser, which sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, some people spritz, you know, a lot of times on like briskets or long cooks, you're spritzing with apple juice or something. But on steaks and a grilling method on a steak where we get the internal temperature, we light smoke. I don't, I'm not a fan of heavy smoke, but we mm -hmm. light smoke at about 250 degrees until it reaches an internal temp of about 122 take it off we have a cast iron fired up at 500 degrees on the traeger ranger and we just lay it on that flat iron about a minute and a half each side two minutes each side at the most brings it up to 130 we let it sit for 15 minutes it gets to 133 cooking by itself then we just let it cool a little bit and then we slice it against the grain so that dry rub mixed with those natural juices through that cooking process and then that reverse sear technique at the mm -hmm. end a lot of people sear at the beginning which i've learned that doesn't make sense now you can still make meat taste good but when you sear at the beginning on high heat you're closing off all of those that access of that flavor and that dry rub to penetrate the meat yeah so yeah. the reverse sear lets it go in, in into the meat and then at the end we hit it with high heat and we close it off so it captures and and, and traps all of the flavor inside the, the crust or the bark or whatever you call mm -hmm. it on the outside of your steak. And that seasoning has been able to sort of sit and marinate with the juices before you go to that sear. So it's sort of uh, getting its wet appetite fed uh, before you sort of go and scorch this meat. Because if you went off right off of the bat with this heavy seasoning and you put it right on the cast iron skillet, you might start burning that <clears throat> seasoning and, and, and things on there. But uh, once you started getting it working with the juices of the meat and then you hit it with the sear, it's, it, it provides that extra protection, but it takes it to a whole new level. Now you got some fatty notes in there. You got some sear notes on that. Um, all that just continues to add with the seasoning, with the meat. It just takes it to a new level. So let's let's start with the provider. We We – get introduced to you through a mutual friend and it, it all becomes into fruition because of hunting camp. I start talking to some mutual friends that this is what my goals are. I really want to be in this section, this sector, this, this part of the culinary industry. I love cooking and I love the idea of dry rubs. I just, for mm -hmm. some reason, I'm not a marinade fan. Never have been. I will marinate chicken once in a while. And, but even I've gotten to the point with my ducks and my geese, which I'm not saying there aren't awesome marinade recipes. I'm just a fan of a dry rub style cook. It's not for everybody, but if people learn it of what dry rubs are doing and what you just explained, you know, I was like just intrigued by it. So you know, we're introduced, you and I are introduced, and the company starts out by what we cook. I said, okay, mm -hmm. with a deer steak, yeah. I like a little bit of flour, black pepper, purple onion, garlic. So we start with that. Okay, so you hear that. You're like, okay, well, for a, for a, a venison-style steak, you know, whitetail or blacktail or mule deer or elk or something like that, we start there. 
Then I said on ducks, I wrote down on paper, here's what we do with ducks. Mm-hmm. I worked with some of our friends, Dave Stanley, Sam Sabini, other people, and my brothers, Clinton Clay of and Chad Mendez of how do we like to cook our ducks? Here's what we like on our ducks. Mm-hmm. Here's what we like on our fish. And I'm like, well, our fish, I'm a huge sushi fan. So we go with you know, butter flakes, we go with soy, we go with ginger, we go with set, you know, sesame, we go with, um, uh, God, it's the word is, what is this green a, stuff it, called? It's a super wasabi, shot, a little bit of wasabi. We got a little horseradish in there as well. And, like a wasabi horseradish. Yep, yep. And so then you put that, that's cut, turns into what we call spawn. One of our rubs. We did one with flaky that's more for a white fish that you mm-hmm. can mix with uh, flour and it becomes what we call batter up and it's going to be our fish fry. So all of these these ideas are taking place at the beginning of our conversations and you're sitting there going, okay, we'll start there. You gave us some flavor profiles. Then you hit me back and we get all these little sample jars. We taste them. We cook with them. And I think we nailed like six or seven out of the 10. No, we nailed like five or six out of the nine because originally there were mm-hmm. nine before we added the paleo rub, the Brit. The Brit. Yep. So you're, you take me back to there of like with your company – and I want to keep this proprietary because I don't want to give out secrets, Patrick, no, of, not what, at all. Not of at what everything we have. Like I just said some of the ingredients and in spawn, but I want to make sure that, you know, we worked hard on these rubs and these flavor mm-hmm. profiles and so did your team. So how does that work? You, you meet me, you ask me for like, okay, so what flavors are you looking for? And then you take it from there. Now, when you, uh, when you approached and we started chatting about all this, think about your uh, cookbook that's coming out. You've been out there, you've hunted deer camps, uh, duck camps. You tried a massive amount of uh, fantastic dishes. And you already had sort of this, hey, man, I really like this orange peel flavor of this, of this, and this on my duck when I was out here at this deer camp. And you told me that story about that. So I go back with all these notes to my team, and half the team are chefs. The great majority of our uh, company have you know, chef inspired, uh, culinary people on there, such as even myself as far as sales. But we take that information from you, from your history. And we're like, Hey, all right, this is what he does. And this is his consumer base. It's going to be out there. They're going to be out there on duck hunts and these, uh, these camps and stuff like that. They're going to have their campfires. They're going to have their cast iron skillets. They're going to cook this, uh, new stuff that they have harvested that day. What would they like to have? And then, our guys look and like these guys want something bold. They want something that's flavorful. They're going to want something that's going to be enjoyable when it hits that cast iron skillet with that oil and it's just searing away. You hear the smell, you, you get the smells, you hear the food cooking and it just lightens up the night, man. You've been to a lot of deer camps and all those memories evolve around food of some sort. So we dove into your brand, your consumers that's going to go out there and try this and we want to beef up the flavor profile. So our team we know a lot of flavor houses, smoke houses, and we can utilize a lot of fun stuff. So when you gave us a few of the uh, ideas, whether it might be uh, the flaky where there's some uh, chili, garlic, and herbs to it, what do we do to beef that up? That's going to be fantastic on whitefish. And our guys just went to town. They, you allowed them to open up the toolbox, and they, they, they provided. I, I swear, like out of the seven or eight, seasonings we made there was not one change to it there was no only, there, there was only two or three that were like hey if we can adjust this adjust that i mean even if you think of the uh, drop time where we have you know some savory notes of uh, tomato and celery some Worcestershire sauce like tang to it um man who doesn't like that i i think that that's a, a key is I guess it's kind of like I was so intrigued through all of our travels and all of the locations we ate. And in the cookbook, uh, the reader and the consumer, the end consumer, Patrick, is going to see that we're not taking credit for these recipes. Like I showed you some examples Mm -hmm. the other night with Tom of like Mr. Billy Bogey in Arkansas Prairie Wings, the cook, you know, his smothered deer steak. It's the best deer steak I've ever eaten. Is it the healthiest? Hell no. Mm-hmm. But it's an amazing way to cook a lot of deer when you're feeding a lot of people in camp. And it's just a great process. Um, but the flavor profiles in that taught me like, man, I could do this with that, with a brown gravy and with this pepper or with this, car, whatever it is. Then you go down to Miss Shelley in, in Honey Break in Louisiana. And we get her sizzling squirrel recipe. And it's in the cookbook. 
and I learn how to cook squirrel and flavor it right. And then I go to Florida and I learn how to cook wh whether it's dolphin or, you know, some of the fish that we're catching offshore down there. And then I go to Kansas and we kill a wild turkey and you're learning that. And then there's so many different experiences that I was learning from Canada to go. We went to Argentina. We have recipes in the cookbook from Argentina, the way they prepare their wild game down there or their domestic beef. There's great beef in Argentina. So you, their, their style of cooking down there and flavoring. And I was like, man, I got all this inspiration. I want these flavor profiles. And that's what I went with you at, went to you with was I want it to taste like this. And you, your team nailed it. There was a couple additions to a couple of them. I don't think there was any takeaways. There might have been one. But when you start thinking back about those original days of lawn, of the provider coming into, you know, it, it, it was going to be real. Were you thinking I was crazy to do 10? Were you like, there's no way we're going to launch 10. He might take three or four of these. Because I know a lot of your customers are like one-offs, right? You have a company here that has one rub or one seasoning salt. And that's what they use on this, on their meat. Yeah. I, so were I, you kind of surprised there was so many? I, I think as we got uh, our conversation going, you were like, I want duck, I want pork, I want big game, I want deer. And it looked like five or six. And then all of a sudden we just kept chatting. More things come up. We want to do a fish fry. We want to do a, a flaky. We want to also do something that's not just a river whitefish, but something that's going to be good on salmon as well. So it just kept going. I'm like, man, we got 10 of these things here. And, uh, I think he came up with the last one, which was the Brit, the paleo one. I'm like, yep, he nailed 10. He's got his 10. And in my mind, I'm thinking he's going to pick out the top four or five and then go with those. There's good, those are going to be his key uh, go-to guys. He's going to ship those out and show these to the world. And then maybe he'll have one or two that he's going to pop out as an LTO throughout the year. Hey, it's, it's duck season coming up. So I'm going to launch this duck seasoning out at this point of the year. And you can only get it for these months. Now you're like, I'm good. Let's go with all 10. And I'm like, I'm just blown up. Holy cow. All right, let's do this. I say, this is a lot of footprint and a lot of shelf space, but, um, these, these seasonings are fantastic. And what you have, uh, shared as far as testimonials where people are saying, man, th these seasonings don't have a whole lot of salt to it, but has a whole lot of flavor. You know, a lot of seasonings out there, main thrust of the formula is salt and sugar, but these, we toned that down just a little bit on the percentage, but really beefed up the flavors and the spices. We wanted these things bold and be able to go a long way. And uh, I think we achieved that. When you start talking about salts though, the way I coated that steak last night, you can't do that if you have a high sodium oh, you no, know, no, rub no, or no. seasoning salt. I've made mistakes like that where grab the wrong thing. Dry rubs are, this is why I love them, is that they're not, ours aren't very high in salt. Now, there are some on the market that are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to play around with them. You have to figure out, like, how do I coat this? Last night, I went heavy on one side of that steak. The steak not only has the flavor, but the, I guess the penetration of these flavors mixed with that fat on a ribeye and those juices searing together, you can't do that with a marinade. I'm telling mm. you, you, with a salty marinade, it's a completely different experience. The right dry rub, and I learned this from Chad Ward. Chad Ward at Whiskey Ben has been very instrumental. So has Matt Pittman at Meat Church. Very instrumental in showing me, more so Ward, just because he's he was always there at hunting camp with me. And I watched this man create these foods that I was like, damn, he's not using a lot of seasoning salts. He's not using any marinades. He's a badass barbecue champion. And I think that when I started to hang out at like the Royal or the Houston or the Memphis in May, and now this October, we're going to be at the Jack Daniels in Lynchburg, which is one of the most sought after barbecue championships in the world. I started watching like what chicken is supposed to taste like, what brisket is supposed to taste like, what pork is supposed, you know, there's all this, how do you cook the right chicken wing? And then none of them are marinating any of this stuff. None of them are breading a chicken wing. Okay. None of them are doing things that, that you, a traditional sports bar would or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're using chicken wings. And then they have all these different applications of dry rubs where 
I'm like, I'm all in on that. I love the idea of dry rubbing a bed or a cookie sheet of chicken wings and blowing people's mind with it, cooking yeah. it the right way to the right temperature, and then maybe even using a reverse sear on that to crisp up the skin. And there are other hints, like Chad Ward, is he's not ashamed to tell any, or he's not scared to tell anybody, you know, cornstarch mixed with your dry rub mm -hmm. is a totally different chicken wing experience. So I think where I'm going with that is – the dry rubs and the amount you can put on meat is up to you. You can yep. flavor it however you want. You can't. You can overdo it if you got a high salt capacity in that rub. You right? can increase the intensity, but you just know that your salt intake isn't going to go through the roof. So you can easily go as light as you want. If your wife wants a little on the light side and you want it on the heavy side, it's made for both. The flavor is fantastic, though. And what's nice about these flavors is the flavors that we add to our seasoning without giving that way proprietary information. We know how to get these flavors in there, plated with everything on there. So as it goes through the cook process and it starts to melt and form to that product, it just it enhances. It opens up the uh, the attributes of those flavors. It, it just sort of blossoms and it just punches you in the face. It's fantastic. What is going on with your team when they are coming up with – the rub like there's no corners cut this company's very serious about the product they're putting out there there's there's a board of directors there's an ownership group there's mm -hmm. a management group there's people that take a lot of pride and i know this from talking to some of them of these flavors are different than a lot of dry rub mixing houses um Explain that. I want to know if there's truth to that and complete transparency. You can go and get dry rubs made down the road here and where we're sitting right now. Um, what makes Life Spice different, in your opinion, in your experience in the culinary world, and in your meetings with this team and watching what they're putting out? Is there a difference? Is there a higher standard? Is there more of a commitment to excellence? a more focus on the end product because I've had dry rubs that I feel are just, I could make that in, in my kitchen. No problem. Mm -hmm. I can go out and do that. I can't, I can't go and replicate the provider rubs in my kitchen. I can't do it. I've tried. I've tried to go in yes, and say, all right, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I can't <laughs> do it. Okay. So is it different, Patrick? And what is different about life, life spice? If it is there, you can tell, those that are excellent at it love what they do. There are seasonings out there. There's rubs out there that is, is about as boring as watching paint dry. And we don't want to be that kind of company. We uh, open source. We love being able to do that where we can open source to go to this type of flavor house, this smoke house, this spice house, and really pull the best flavors out there. And our guys that work in the R&D, uh, the food scientists and the chefs there, they love food. And they will go out there and say, hey, how would I want this made at my at my house? Um, knowing that they can open source and pull the best flavors out there to make the best product available, that they just nail it. But they'll go to the store and grab meats and try it themselves. Once Before we ship out the seasoning to you, we will actually take it and make it. And, you know, We've got ovens and grills. We'll go get some product down the road. We'll season it up and try it. Hey, is this too hot? Does it have too much of this to it? We'll try it before we uh, send it out to you, and we try to make sure that it's on point before we do. Um, you know, how we produce these seasonings, um, we have a breadth of information. We have a gentleman that, that has been in the meat seasoning industry for over 40 years, and his knowledge was just sucked up by the rest of the team. Those guys really know what they're doing, and when they go out and create these new seasoning blends, um, it's as almost as if they're in the restaurant cooking for, you know, they own that restaurant. They're going to cook for the, the people that are coming in that night. Um, they put these meals together. They put these seasonings together because in the end they want to see people trying these, people getting excited about this. Uh, so our company is a culinary-driven company, and it is an exciting company. Everybody loves what they do. And it shows. I feel like, um, hell, this is my first sales gig. Thinking, am I really good or is it just the products? Because sales have been going through the roof. And I think it comes down to our culinary team that really focuses on flavor um, and the intensity, color, look, taste, down to the nitty-gritty. If you want some duck fat flavor into those seasonings, we can do that. 
you want some uh, ribeye fatty flavors in your seasoning, we can do that. We will make that just incredible for you. What is Life Spice as far as their portfolio goes? Are you just the dry rub mixing company? Oh, no, not at all. We do everything from snacks to seafood to uh, to proteins. So you can imagine we can we do jerky. Uh, kettle companies will make products, baked beans. We got, a, I think, a bourbon bacon baked bean out there um, to seafood houses where we've got an applewood barbecue glaze. That, that one's pretty fantastic where we can make seasonings that sort of melt as it goes on to a warm sort of wet surface all of a sudden all the flavors and the seasonings and things dissolve and it turns into a glaze. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. Uh, so the, the techniques and the, I'd say the toolbox that we have to get to play with is intriguing. Who's responsible for that toolbox? Is there a story behind Life Spice of how did somebody go, I'm going to help people create the best food experiences that they have potentially can? Our guys, uh, you know, we, we do several things. We have a culinary council that we do a couple times a year. We'll go and do a dine around, see what the latest crave is going on out there with some big time chefs, try to see what flavor profiles they're using. How can then we take that dish and make a, a seasoning out of that? Um, also, we go to a lot of trade shows to check out various suppliers out there and the quality that they can produce. And then we bring those new learnings to our kitchen and we just have a massive library that we can just pull from. But is it, is there a, a story of who did this and why? Our owner was thoroughly right off the bat. I want to be a culinary driven company. And, you know, there's a lot of places that just have food scientists, but there's also chefs that really have that really great palate. So how can I take this, idea of not wanting to make boring seasonings just because I want to grow the company, but to make some exciting seasonings, it's going to make a difference in people's lives. If I'm going to make some flavorful seasonings, I'm going to need some chefs. Half the sales team are chefs. Um, I'd say half the R&D team are chefs. So we love making awesome products. It's just, it's just in our nature. Well, how do you go from being a chef to a salesman though? Getting lucky. So, <laughs> so this guy, this guy makes you an offer you can't refuse to take you out of the cooking world. I was doing R and D at that time, uh, where the products that I was making went out to three, four, five hundred restaurants. So here I am doing promos for this uh, specific brand. I guess being a chef, you know, I went from working in a single restaurant to working in manufacturing to them working as an R&D chef for a company that had five, 600 restaurants. So what I was making ended up being on the plates of hundreds of restaurants, going into hundreds of people's uh, meals for that day and having them come into the restaurant and try those. Those are exciting times for a chef to know that you came to their restaurant and they trust you to make something that's going to excite their night. You know, maybe they're out there with their wife, uh, a significant other or whatever to enjoy an evening together and who doesn't want to make memories around food and so the chef always loves to look out and see the smile on the people's faces so even when i got to the big stage of uh, making products that went to so many hundreds of restaurants you can see the the tweets you can see the facebook post of hey you got to go try this this is amazing to then given this opportunity where now i'm working for a seasoning company that is culinary driven. It, I still love knowing that I get samples sent to my house that I get to play with. But here I am working with you to make something that is going to feed the masses and make them happy. And I get excited about that. So even though I'm in sales, um, I still think what we come up with, our ideas, we keep bouncing these things off each one uh, of one another. Then I'm talking to the chefs at my company and then they start bouncing some ideas off and then we come up with something that's just incredible that we know is going to create an exciting memorable moment for whoever gets to use these when you you know you're you're a chef and you're culinary trained and you're talking about making these experiences better for people what if are some of the negatives that have come in your career you're in your 40s now you're trained culinary you know your way around food you know how to cook 
I, I'm thinking of like critics, like where when the negativity comes into something that you've worked so hard to do, you know, and you're like have all this passion in it, and you didn't cut any corners. And then when today's world, it's so easy for everybody to be a foodie or a crit, a food critic, and everybody's mm-hmm. taking pictures of their lunch. And I mean, the owner of Barstool Sports does his pizza review at all these different pizza restaurants from across the country. Who knows if he has the the qualifications to even say what a good pizza is. It's just his opinion, right? Mm -hmm. But in your opinion, being educated and trained in the culinary world, have you had to face that negative, pessimistic attitude of like, oh man, that food's not that good. You could have done better on that, Patrick. That rub's not that good. Have you had that in your career too? I'd say every chef knows this is they're their biggest critic. Um, Every time they create a dish, a new idea... Um, they'll beat it up a hundred ways from Sunday, uh, just to try to get to that final. I've, I've hit this moment. I think it's ready to share. So I think chefs are their biggest critics. So as a culinary driven company and we make things out there, I think we blow more minds because we're critic of ourselves before a sample goes out and the end users just blown away by what we sent to them because we have already beat it up every which way we can. Um, yeah, sometimes I've seen that. Hey, Patrick, yeah, this wasn't your best, best. Okay. That's not going to stop me. Let's talk this through and let's figure this out. Cause I want to make this here at the house and I want to see where did I miss this? Okay. I understand what you're talking about. Let's go ahead and adjust this and adjust that. And then let's, uh, make this a home run. So yeah, you can't hit it a hundred percent. I mean, Baseball batters don't hit a thousand percent. So they only have to hit it three out of 10 times being all star. It's right. the hardest sport in the world. Right. Patrick. Right. So what did you do with those shrimp last night? I took the, uh, I took the spawn and I had a little bit of your, uh, extra virgin olive oil that you get from this amazing place out in California, tossed it in the olive oil, coated them really well. Then I put it on the grill. There was a little bit of smoke that you adjusted on that Traeger grill, but right there after I got that smoke going, I cranked that sucker up and really got some sear on those uh, on the shrimp. And it just turned out amazing. So there was there no butter on those? No, sir. That was just a little olive oil and spawn? Yes, sir. Because I've taken that spawn with just a little brushing of olive oil on the grill because you always got to be careful when you're open grilling with olive oil. And I've put it on salmon and just laid it on there. No butter, nothing. And people are like, you you cook this in butter. You flash fry this in butter. I'm like, no, that came off a grill with spawn on it, mm-hmm. with just a little coating mm-hmm. of, with a barbecue brush on the grill so it doesn't stick. I th- I, we barely put enough olive oil on there just to get the seasoning to adhere really well and to just add that extra layer. But I think, uh, you know, in that particular product itself, we know we want some good butter notes in there. So we do have some butter flavor that we've we've used in that seasoning it's that's where you're kind of getting that buttery note from so then i went to you and i said okay um i love duck fried rice i love duck chow mein i love deer Mm -hmm. i do a lot of because when you're in hunting camp and let's say you're in canada and you have such liberal limits you know you can kill eight geese a day and eight ducks a day per man well we hunt to eat, so we're not going to the store. We might go down there to get some tortillas. Yep. We, and if we can get tortillas a better way and homemade, then we'll do that. But we try to get all the vegetables out of a garden. We try to bring mm-hmm. our own if it's that right time of year. My brother Clay's got the provider garden. So you, you'll you see tonight, we're going to do Traeger pizzas tonight with the rubs, and you're going to see all these different vegetables and flavor profiles. But So I go to you with an Asian idea. I love Asian yep. food. Yep. I love anything from pho soups to sushi to fried rices, but I like them with wild game. I mm-hmm. like doing them myself with a, with a big wok and getting the rice made and then cooling it off and then doing fried rice with duck meat and carrots and, you know, all the different seasonings, uh, the rubs and everything, and then all of the different vegetables that we put in there. Then you crack the eggs and get those going in there. Water chestnuts going in there. Well, I try to be very authentic with it. So I told you I want a mm-hmm. very authentic Asian Flavoring. So what does that do to you guys? What does your team say? Okay, here's how we go to work. Tell me a little bit about what we call the dragon. In the uh, dragon, let's say recently we worked with a chef up in Chicago and we did, uh, we went to a little Chinatown in Chicago and we actually went and did regional look of Asia. So we 
took all the different types of regions in in uh, China, and we try to figure out what are those predominant flavor profiles. So in this one, we took all that knowledge that we soaked up from that dine around. We looked at some far eastern flavors. We made this Asian sweet heat combo. Um, it it's got a beautiful color to it. Uh, like you said, hey, I want this dragon, and we're thinking this thing needs to look red. It needs to have some sweet heat to it. But uh, also, when you're talking about Chinese restaurant, Japanese restaurant, some wok cooking, things like that, what are some of those char notes from the wok, and how do we introduce those flavors into the seasoning? And that's how we 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 came up with that idea and the flavors we used. So, have you personally cooked with the dragon? All of them. I've got all, I've the got dragons. All, I've got all your seasonings. So and now you move all. on. Now I come at you and I say, okay, well, we also do. Mexican night, a lot. We mm-hmm. do a lot of Mexican food with wild game. And I'm talking from fish tacos with wild halibut to crappie to walleye tacos. We do a ton of duck enchiladas and duck tacos, duck burritos. If you go out in the shop right now, we did probably 70 goose burritos in tortillas. We freeze them and then we'll just take them on the road, let them thaw mm-hmm. out, eat them up, boom done they're great right but we use what we call the provider of the sonora on our mexican now where do you go with the ideology behind a great fiesta seasoning like the sonora on that one we tried to look like tex-mex but not be tex-mex okay what is sort of tex-mex but what is that hunter um outdoor flavor profile need to be and what's gonna what are we gonna do to make it exciting so we did we actually did a smoky cumin in there uh we added uh, the caramelized onions and some paprika there are little things that we added as far as flavors and ideas that sort of took it to the next level it's, it just wasn't sort of your boring tex-mex uh taco seasoning kind of thing like that but something that was that was really unique something that was sort of authentic but had some tweaks to it Here's a here's a authentic Tex Mex, but yet, how can we change that up? And I think a nice smoky cumin, uh, and some of the other caramelized flavors that we added to it. Caramelized flavors in the Sonora, mm-hmm. meaning what? Who who? Let's say uh, caramelized onions in a, in a cast iron skillet over a campfire. What are those char notes? What are those caramelized notes? And add those to the uh, to the season. My brother Clint, very picky eater. Mm-hmm. Okay, chef doesn't. I mean, he's, his brain works in a different way than mine. He's got a master's degree in physical therapy, but he loves wild game. He tasted duck tacos, deer tacos, elk enchiladas. He says that Sonora is by far the best Mexican food he's ever had. Now, that's saying a lot because we spend time in Chico mm-hmm. and all over the farming lands and communities of California where it's nothing to go find very authentic Latino or Mexican food. Americans have ruined Mexican food in a lot of ways. You yeah. Yeah. you eat Mexican food, you don't see That's it covered true. with a whole pound of cheddar cheese, right? Refried beans are completely different, authentic Mexican food than they are. So my experience is I want to be able to take somebody of like, like in Jen, you've met our mm-hmm. assistant Jen. She's very good at street tacos. Remy Warren, a good friend of mine. We do goose street tacos. Him and Olympic gold medalist David Wise, we've done them several times together with the Sonora, and they're like blown away by the flavor of that Sonora rub. So when my brother Clint said, that's the best Mexican food I've eaten, that's saying a lot. And I believe Mm -hmm. in that rub. So then you move on from there, and I'm like, okay, well, we also deal with chuckers, partridge, and pheasants, and quail, and some of these oily upland birds, but some drier meat upland birds, like a a pheasant is a little bit drier than a quail. is is uh, sage hen is noticeably or historically the worst tasting upland game that you could have. I wanted to come up with a rub to where you could mix it in soups because we do a lot of pheasant mm-hmm. soup. We do a lot of chucker soup. We do a lot of like white meat soups like you would with like chicken noodle, right? Well, we do a lot of that with our upland game. We don't hunt a lot of upland game, but we have friends that kill them and we're not afraid to cook them and eat them. So now we move into this flavor profile of how, and my first words to you were, I freaking hate pheasant meat. Most yep. people, if I don't That's cook right. pheasant, I and I don't mean this like arrogantly, and I'm, I'm like this with a lot of foods. I'm like this with salmon. If I don't cook my own salmon, I rarely eat it. Pheasant, I will not eat unless I cook it. 
So I went to you and said, I need a dry rub that's going to take pheasant to, you know, and obviously there's an education process when you're mm -hmm. talking to somebody about how to cook a pheasant. A lot of people do this, take it off the bone, cube it up. And then they mix it with what? Freaking cream of mushroom soup. And I'm like, that's the grossest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm not going to eat what that, whatever that chucker or that pheasant goulash is or whatever it is. It's, it just doesn't, I don't like that. It's not creative to me. It's not unorthodox. So I wanted a rub to where we could take strips of pheasant or cubes and put them in a soup or put them in a lettuce wrap. I love the idea of yeah. lettuce wraps. So then the covey was born. These names are pretty badass too, by they the way. Are. They you are. Got, we'll talk about Tom and all of our marketing and the the label des, the label design and all that because mm -hmm. you're in love with that from what you've told me. So, talk to me about the Covey. The Covey, um, when you provided that information to us about the pheasant and things like that, what are we going to do on our end to say, hey, we're going to grill up a pheasant and see how we're going to make this thing taste better. And we used a blend of thyme, onions, and garlics, and we used it at a certain ratio that all blended together so you didn't get punched in the face with nothing but garlic or nothing but thyme or nothing but onion. But we have a fantastic, sophisticated uh, team there that knows how to use those flavors at a certain ratio to achieve its point where you hit all the mouth sensations you get the salt, you get the uh, sour, you get the heat, and they all sort of hit your palate as you're eating it, and then you end up swallowing it. It hits everything. It's not like ghost pepper, holy cow, it's hot, but I have no idea what this tastes like as far as a flavor profile because my mouth lit on fire. So how do we sometimes make a ghost pepper seasoning where you actually taste the flavor, but you get the heat? Um, and I think our team is really good at saying, how do I hit all the places on your tongue as you're eating this product that's going to hit those taste buds light them up get you excited uh, for that next bite so in all what is covey all in all like how do you describe covey it is it is your traditional blend of thyme uh, onion and garlic those are your main sort of flavor drivers on that one it's so freaking good mm -hmm. and when you describe a dry rub of what it does to the palate the tongue the lips the gums of the mouth taste buds where it starts in your mouth. Think about what I was thinking about when you're talking about like a whiskey tasting or a wine tasting. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what you're doing. Like when you're doing a whiskey tasting, you don't want to shock your mouth with like a high proof burning your mouth whiskey because right. it's not going. And then when you do a whiskey tasting, a lot of times you'll taste the first one, then you'll water down, taste the second one, water down, and then usually whiskey tastings are three mm -hmm. three three different blends. Then you taste the third barrel and then you water down again and you go back and taste the first one because the first one doesn't get a fair chance because it's the one that goes in and shocks your taste buds, right? Right. right. So then you, your mouth is you, your palate and all of those things with dry rub. It's the same thing. If you put a ghost pepper in there and it like lights you up, like that jalapeno did to me mm -hmm. last night that I shouldn't have eaten, <laughs> then you don't get the flavor. That's why I've never understood people and one of our producers, and I hope Tyson listens to this, because I'll spend, I'll work my ass off cooking a meal. I mean, a really good breakfast or a really good fried rice or something. And this son of a bitch will douse it with an, a whole bottle of Tabasco. And I love Tabasco. Use the right way. People mm -hmm. don't even know how to use hot sauces. They think, let's just pile. It's like, okay, do you even know what a hash brown is supposed to taste like? Right. Or do you just like to right. taste the ketchup that much? I, that really hurts my feelings, and I want to not punch somebody, but maybe shake them a little bit of like, mm -hmm. bro, you don't – I love the taste of hot sauce. But then why why don't you just drink the hot sauce? At, at some point, I look, I fully agree. I look at some of the things that I see out there. Is even with my kids, they may douse something in a big pile of barbecue sauce, and I'm like – you want some steak with that barbecue sauce? Like, <laughs> I think your your ratio is a little off. Um, and I remember a time back at the CIA, we did this uh, really unique um, sort of sensory test where we tasted four different things at uh, different impact powers or the palate powers um, on the strength on your palate. Then you went back to number one and tried number one all over. And it had a totally different taste. Like you said about the whiskey, your first initial taste of the whiskey on that first one shocks your palate. But then you go back and try later and you're like, all right, I can pick up this note, this note, this note, and this note. And uh, our team has gone through that as far as sensory taste. Um, 
And I think as they start building their flavors, they're like, okay, great. I know this isn't going to punch you in the face with heat and you're not going to get any other flavor out of this. So they really make sure that the flavors flow really well. Um, and it's just not overpowering with one particular ingredient. So you, we've laid down a couple flavors, but then one of our biggest sellers um, and one of our main ones that I use a ton, I didn't use it last night because I, I'm really trying to, this crosshairs has got my attention on steak now. But the drop tine mm-hmm. was the one that we developed for venison yep. and domestic beef. Now, I really want to get the word out there, like maybe we shot ourselves in the foot because drop tine is an amazing, amazing domestic beef rub. Mm-hmm. Crosshairs is an amazing domestic hamburger rub. So are we killing ourselves, but we want to educate the consumer, the end consumer, the potential consumer that, yes, this can be transitioned into domestic chicken or pork or beef or lamb, whatever you're doing. Right. So drop tine on steak, unfreaking real on beef. Mm-hmm. But it's also unbelievable on what I told you about, you know, my dad's deer steak around an open spit or around an open campfire. Yep. That's what we wanted to try to emulate. Some back strips, deer back strips. Oh, the, bre- the, the, the tenderloin or the straps. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean unbelievable piece of meat right right tender as heck what is drop time we wanted to really gear this one up as like you know look at when i went to deer camp and what we did back in the day and i thought man some nice um to make savory tomato notes we there's some celery in there as well but like i said we go back to using flavors and we did use some uh like a worcestershire sauce type flavor into there so you now have that um, bit of tang to your seasoning, and that sort of I think that really elevated it. And the 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 color of drop tine is kind of that of dragon a little bit. Um, it it has a lot of that like roasted savory tomato powder in there, so it does have that sort of dullish red color look to it. Um, but yeah, it it isn't like that pop hot looking red dragon though. But it is uh, it is incredible. What is it? What is it that makes it so good with red meat? Man, that's hard. I think uh, as you look to grill off your, let's say, back straps of your deer meat, and you've got those uh, savory notes of the tomato that's in there, um, caramelizing, adding that tomato flavor to it, and you got some celery that people would just freshly cut celery out there to add to this cast iron dish pot. Um, and then, hey, what, what kind of other flavors you want in there? Let's add some Wisher sauce to there. Let's add some salt, pepper, and some other herbs. And now you got this one pot dish that you created over the the, the campfire. Um, I remember back in my day when I lived in Arkansas and I went to deer camp for the first time with my buddy and I show up and I didn't realize he was the youngest of nine. And I see a couple older gentlemen thinking one of them is dad. And uh, this is a deer camp they did every year, and they had purchased this 1970s style like school bus. And they're all math geniuses, all engineers. They took out the seats, they put bunk beds in there, they built this uh, table that went from the driver's window all the way to the back window that flopped up. And I swear, I didn't know he had this many kids and this much family, but that night around that campfire, I'd say about 15 cars show up to our deer camp site. And all these moms and kids brought out these uh, crock pots. And you can think of this cube meat like you're talking about in with a tomato, um, like a stew in a crock pot. And that's sort of that theme for this particular item. And when you start talking about the flavor of drop time and and the the ability for it to take red meat to the next level, is th- because here's my question to you is that a lot of people just like salt and pepper on a steak. It's a great steak. Mm -hmm. American almond beef, salt and pepper. You don't even need salt and pepper. Right. That was a little plug there, (laughs) but you really don't. I mean that I'll cook you another one a night with nothing on it. It's really good meat, but should I put drop time on a beef steak or is it too much for a beef steak? I love it. I love it on deer steak. I love it on all. I mean, you could put on vegetables. You threw it across the bed of asparagus on a veggie tray and a Traeger, a little bit of olive oil. Unbelievable. Great color, great taste, but it's not salt and pepper on a piece of red meat. It's a different 
it's a different rub for red meat. So are we doing the rub in, injustice not putting it on something that's not red meat? It Should it go on chicken or drop time was made for red meat? Man, that's a good question because I'm a simplistic type guy where I want to, like we went back to um, too much steak sauce on a, on a steak that you just cut. And, hey, do you want you know some steak with that sauce that you just had? Are we putting something that's too much of a flavor profile on something to mask the steak? And I'm a minimalist. I love just salt and pepper on my steak. But sometimes I will take the drop time or I will take the uh, – um, crosshairs, and I will add that to the salt and pepper just to beef it up. But you know, sometimes I want that impact flavor taste on my palate. But last night, but, did you like that steak? You already said you did. Oh, absolutely. It was amazing. <laughs> like that's And it the, didn't need the, like you said, it was such amazing steak. You didn't need this seasoning, but that seasoning made the steak. It just enhanced it, gave you a little bit more uh, flavor profile perspective out there. But when you look at, uh, let's say, deer meat out there, back straps, if it hasn't been bled out very well, you might have this gaminess taste to it. So sometimes people want to try something that's just not just salt and pepper on it, but add some more flavors to maybe not necessarily cover it up, but enhance it. Um, and I think those type of dishes warrant using the drop time. But Here's the deal with it, though. I would say American almond beef doesn't need rub. It doesn't need salt and pepper. But... With crosshairs on it, with a little bit of salt and pepper or garlic salt and pepper, it's way better than without it. Like the beef's good, mm -hmm. but when you start mixing that fat of a ribeye and those yep. juices with that, what we talked about with that dry rub of the crosshairs did last night, and it's the same thing that mm -hmm. drop time does, it makes the steak better. Yeah. But a lot of people are like, well, I'm just a salt and pepper guy or girl. I'm a medium rare salt and pepper guy, a medium salt and pepper guy. I'm a medium rare crosshairs guy now. That steak last night, in my opinion, it tasted better than the steak we had the night before. I know that's saying a lot. That is saying and a the, lot. We the went steak to the, the night restaurant. before was amazing. Oh, absolutely. But that steak last night didn't have garlic butter on the top. It didn't have blue cheese on the top. It didn't have anything mm -hmm. like that on it. It had dry rub. It didn't even have any olive oil. Those flavor profiles, the deal coming up, the sensory that you experienced trying it here i am now i got these butter notes i get these fatty notes i get this uh i get this dill coming up slight bit of heat here i am just now exposing my palate to this flavor profile that is just incredible at that point so it enhanced the meal ultimately the steak didn't need it but did it enhance the the evening did it take our palates to a whole new level where we couldn't stop i mean we couldn't stop talking about it after even cutting up a bunch of that steak we went and grabbed some burger buns and threw uh some of the sliced meat on that and just tore into it i took one and added some of the uh the shrimp on top of it made a sandwich with it we just could not stop eating that meat and talking about the flavor profiles and i think that's what that your your seasonings bring is okay, it's not your salt and pepper night grill off. It is, I want to see what kind of enhanced experience I'm going to have using this unique rub. What, um, I, I got to know this real quick before we move on to the, the last two rubs I want to talk about before I get you out of here. I love this shit. I could talk about, <laughs> I could talk about it all day. It's food. We can talk about <clears throat> food all day long. When you but love you food, mentioned that, I'm sorry, that you, you say that what you're going to say just now when you talk about what, all day long what? We could talk about food all day long because it it's a shared experience. Everybody's got to eat, but that uh, that consumption of something that you look forward to or you enjoy just enhances your your life on a daily basis. Uh, there's a reason you pick the restaurants you go to eat at. the The meal that you decided to prepare is uh, it may spark a memory. It may spark, hey, I know it's gonna. It's something my kids like. I want to feed my kids something that he loves tonight for dinner. Um, and they're going to take this throughout their life. Hey, I remember mom, I remember dad making me this meal, and it was one of my favorite ones. You can talk about food all day long. Most memories out there for p folks um, all evolve around food. Europe, duck camp, 
the south, mm-hmm. the southeastern part of our country, it's all crawfish boil. You heard me on the phone today with Drew Keith. Like, we're talking crawfish boils. I mean, fish fries. You go to Wisconsin on a Friday night with fish fry. It's cold beer and fried yeah. walleye and memories and stories and laughs and jokes and ribbing and friendship and kinship and family and friends. It's just nonstop America, right? Food mm-hmm. is all over the world. It's a social gathering event. I mean, you sit down at a bath style restaurant here, you're sitting next to strangers. By the end of the night, you're exchanging phone numbers yep. and you're eating beef tongue and you're That's eating right. sweet breads and you're eating tripe and stomach lining a cow and the freaking the, the glands of a cow's throat. Sweet breads are some of my favorite food. That's fantastic. With the provider rub and you cold smoke them on a Traeger on one of the old school Traeger cold mm. smokers. My buddy Jim Ray with our provider rubs, best sweet breads I've ever had. You start messing with the thymus gland of a cow, who in the frick would eat that? I will. I will now. <clears throat> Basco mm-hmm. people are unbelievable, but the kinship is awesome. So now we move on to the Brit. Paleo rub, I love it on vegetables. I love it on meat. I put it in soups. I put it in gravies. I put it on eggs. It's unbelievable. Why do I feel like eggs. that's a good universal seasoning? It's so universal. To me, I think that is. Why? Here I am saying, hey, we need something that's paleo. But it's not geared towards a specific meat. So our team didn't say, all right, well, what is the base going to be? I'm not going to tell them it's uh, it's deer meat or it's uh, elk or it's bison. I'm like, I want a paleo version that is good and universal. And that's, that's sort of where the team went with that. You think we nailed it? Who didn't? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's pretty fantastic. My friend, Brittany Ledoux, her, you'll meet her and her husband, Brad, tonight. She was you know, getting married, and she's like, oh, I'm going to get in my dress. I want to do all this stuff. I'm working out, and she's, she looks great. But, it, you know, that paleo rub is what mm-hmm. she wanted. She's like, we need a good paleo rub for people that don't want sugars and want to really, like, cut right. weight and lose inches and stuff like that. So we named it the Brit. And Tom came up with this badass design and on the label, but that it's named after a girl named Brittany Ledoux, who's a local oh, here cool. in Reno. You'll meet her tonight. So now I want to make sure we covered them all. We covered, let's say that we covered the Covey. Mm-hmm. We talked about Flaky. We talked about, we There's talked the about, foul. there's um, the foul. The foul was like a sweet I'm, wait, I'm going into the last mm. two, Uh-oh. but we talked, we talked about the flaky. We talked about the spawn. We talked about the crosshairs. We talked about the drop time. We talked about the dragon. We talked about the Sonora. We talked about the, that we've talked about eight, right? Mm-hmm. We have two left. We're going to go, we're going to end with the, the universal favorite by everybody, but foul um, is unbelievable. Like I'm talking, Dave Stanley and me, Sam Sabini, we got together and we gave you the flavor profiles for ducks. But I'm I'm talking, you put foul on chicken wings, you'll never go to BBW or no, whatever they call that place yeah, again. Yeah. And I like that place. Yeah. Okay, but it ain't nothing compared to our chicken wings. I promise you. Um, and I've learned this. You may guys have to like reach Chad out to him and say, hey, you want to try some of this? Yeah, you uh, need to put this on your, on your wings. But I'm telling yeah. you, with Traeger style grilled wings, skin on, no batter, no anything on them except dry rub. And you can use a little bit of cornstarch, the Chad mm-hmm. Ward secret. Dude, the foul is unreal on ducks and geese and freaking Cornish game hens. We did it on the other night. Clay did some Cornish game hens, which is a weird phenomenon. Like, just go get a chicken. But we got the Cornish game hens. They're good. They're tasty, right? But what Absolutely. is foul? Foul, we, uh, on this one, we did a sweet maple pairing with uh, smoked paprika and some bright citrus notes. Um, that That is where we came about with fowl. We wanted we wanted some of that maple, some of that orange. And then we also, instead of just regular, uh, up this scale with uh, some smoked paprika, get some chilies in there, but also have that citrus notes of, you know, it's not like a citric acid that, hey, I got this sour note now on my tongue. No, we actually went out there and we got some really bright, fresh citrus flavors that we added to this fowl as well. Almost like you're taking a lemon and a lime and just squeezing it over your uh, over your uh, duck while it's while it's grilling. Oh my gosh! Like <laughs> I I can't tell you how many meals I've cooked with it. I use it like it's going out of style. It's my favorite, hands down. I love the artwork on it. I mm-hmm. love the idea. I love the flavor profiles. I love the ingredients. I love the freaking idea of cooking duck with no marinade. Because everybody's like, you got to marinate it, you got to wrap it in bacon, you got to have a palapino, you got to have the mm-hmm. world's worst ingredient of all time. People that eat it are weird. It's cream cheese. I won't look at it. I can't smell it. I can't <laughs> touch it. People put it in sushi. I'm like, well, what? Cream cheese doesn't go with raw fish, bro. But anyway, I'm not looking down on anybody, Patrick. I'm simply saying, 
that people that eat cream cheese are weird, mm-hmm. in my opinion. But there's way more ways to cook a duck than a popper. Poppers can be good, done the right way, right? Starting the bacon, making mm-hmm. sure that the duck doesn't overcook because your bacon's not crispy yet. But when you douse a popper with fowl or you do a recipe, just a duck breast, and you want it on a bed of hunter rice or a, some brown rice with some cauliflower and broccoli or some peas or some corn, whatever, the fowl is unreal. Skin on. It is. Skin on, freaking oh, get that fat rendering a little bit, that crispy skin mixed with that foul rub, you you will swear that it's been marinated for 48 mm-hmm. hours. And the charmalization, I, I think that's a new word, but my old boss and I used to say that a lot when we took uh, wings that were marinated and in and, and this awesome seasoning, and then we put it on, on a flat top and just sort of like charmalized it around, get some of those little crusty uh, notes on there, but... You know, with that maple syrup in there and with that brown sugar as well, uh, the bright citrus notes, the caramelization on those wings are amazing. Unfreaking believable. I wish I'm going to do some chicken wings tonight with the pizzas. We have okay. to. We got to do some wings. Blow your mind, wings. I'm sure you know how to do really Let's good do wings. It. We'll kick this. some ass on some yeah, wings tonight. So now we go into the universal, all undisputed champion of all the provider rubs. And you could put this on bacon. You can put this mm-hmm. on pancakes. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm putting on pancakes. I'm not kidding you. I have. So you think about a pig in a blanket with some sausage, maple sausage, or just sausage rolled up in a pancake with a little bit of maple syrup. You put this on pancakes, just a little douse of this rub that we're getting ready to introduce. And... I'm telling you, mix with a little bit of butter on a pancake, you don't need syrup. Try it. Now, it might not be for everybody, but if you think about a pigs in a blanket where you're mm-hmm. mixing the pancake with the sausage texture or a bite of sausage, you it's unbelievable flavor. So anyway, this rub we call the swine, pork chops, and Boston mm. butts, and anything that you can think of that's you could put on anything. Vegetables. I, I use it in baked beans. It's unreal in baked beans. I was just going to say baked beans. There's some really good baked beans recipes that we have coming out that we've worked with some people on. Um, as far as the cookbook goes, volume two, I love baked beans. I'm a mm-hmm. huge fan of them. I love refried beans done the right way. I'm a bean fan. But swine rub, talk to me about it. Swine rub, that was an, a, a fun one to work off of. Um, it had a lot of discussion around it, like, okay, what type of barbecue flavors are we trying to hit with? Are we trying to um, look at Sweet Baby Ray's type barbecue seasoning? Are we looking at Rendezvous or uh, Cattleman's or Kansas City, Memphis, Texas, South Carolina? What type of barbecue seasoning do we need to use? Is it a Sweet Baby Ray's type flavor profile that is recognized nationwide? Our guys are amazing when it comes to uh, barbecue seasonings. This one was a good sweet but a savory, and we had some uh, bacon notes in there as well. Um, we wanted to enhance that that pork experience, whether you're camping out and you got this all over your pork and you're cooking it over a spit um, to roasting it off and uh, cooking it off in your green egg or Traeger grill. Now, Tell me, though, what swine is as far as where does the sweetness come from? Because there is a little tiny bit of sweetness in swine, but it's got a bold sweetness. Could you describe it as a bold I, sweetness? Like I can't, whether we, it has the sorghum in there, um, which not a lot of people know, but it's, you know, we have brown sugar in there. So we have molasses, we have sorghum in there. Um, and these are some rich, dark sweetness uh that will pop out, but we did add a whole lot of savory notes to balance off that sweetness. So you do see some savory bacon um, and warmer chilies in there as well. The swine, yeah, it's freaking unbelievable. I'm gonna end this I, podcast. I think when it comes down to the adding sorghum and stuff to it, it it just took it to a whole new level. We could sit here and tell the end consumer, the potential customer, until we're blue in the mm-hmm. face of. But we can't of, tell them all the fun stuff about but, it. But well, here's the deal: if they take the plunge into provider and they taste swine, mm-hmm. they'll never quit eating swine. If you want to be unorthodox, if you want to think outside of the box, if you want to change things up, if you want to become what we termed a backyard aficionado, mm-hmm. do you want your friends and family to come into your back gate and look at your backyard and smell those flavors and see the trees and listen to the birds 
and hear the stories and the jokes and the cold beers and the toasts and then taste the food and you want to take pride in that and you want people to be like, wow, you don't want them to kiss your ass. You don't want them to tell them anything that's not true. But if you want to put out the best product that you possibly can mm-hmm. in your backyard, we're not saying that we're any better. I'm an average griller at best. But I've learned and looked at people and just got a huge passion for it. And I want to think different. I want to try different things. That's what the provider rubs are all about. So, Patrick, when you see something like this, with you being part of this brand and helping us from the beginning, look at this. Let me introduce you to our printout campaign. I think I've told you, and you've sent me those pictures all the time. And I'm, I'm like, who is your photography folks out there? Because the photography that you have produced, the uh, POPs, the point of purchase material, um, the ads that you're taking out, the stuff that you see on Instagram, um, hell, I see it on Facebook. And I'm like, like, share, like, share, love, share. But for you and your owner. That is gorgeous. This Look at this that two-page spread out in the new Wild Fowl Gear issue. We got these going in a lot of magazines. But you show that to your owner, that's going to give Life Spice a lot of pride that your your team has come up with a, a partnership with us at the Provider mm-hmm. Life. Chad Mendez, Clay Building, Clint Building, Tom Rashashin, Jennifer Swenson, you name it, Jim Ray, everybody that's in the Provider Cookbook. I can go on and on. But we have had so much influence and inspiration over the years in cooking and culinary. We're not trailblazers. We're not sitting here saying that we're inventing mm-hmm. recipes, man. We're My dad cooked fried rice 25 years ago for me. I just love the idea. I like trying it different ways. I've cooked fried rice on a sheet of foil on an open grill. Picture that. Wow. I was putting little things around to get the pineapple. I would build walls so the juices didn't leak out. I would add the duck at the right time so it didn't overcook. Couldn't really get the crispiness of the fried rice, but the flavor was unbelievable. You just got to think outside the box. You got to yeah. want to do it. And when you want to do it, try the provider, theproviderlife.com. Thank you, Life Spice. Thank you, Patrick McKinney. This is unbelievable. The that is, that here. is an unbelievable, unbelievable spread. And I, I will we'll always have Tom keep sign telling one you, for your, for your, your guys, uh, in, as far as photography, our guys looking at your brand, seeing what it's about, and knowing that we need to step up our game, make sure that what we provide is on point. It's going to meet your expectations, and it's going to meet your customers' expectations. When they try that product out on their steaks or on their uh, pork butt, and they're cooking that off their salmon, they're going to be like, man, Chad was on something on this one. We got we got it done. We got the rubs done. They are so good. We are so proud of them. Thank you, Life Spice. Thank you for being here, Patrick. McKinney, this has been another episode. Thank you, Chad. Yes, sir. Another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody. Jack Daniels, thank you for believing in the provider. Jack Daniels just told me they're putting the provider cookbook in their store in Lynchburg, Tennessee, in the square. Fantastic. Humbling. Man. Huge opportunity. We're getting ready to go into another podcast. Today, we're podcasting with the following individuals. We had, um, earlier today, we had a Wildfowl Magazine podcast for the Wildfowl Gear issue over on the Fowl Life. Now we have Patrick McKinney from Life Spice on This Life Ain't For Everybody. We just recorded that and you heard that. Now I'm going into a podcast with UFC badass TJ Dillashaw, who just made his return to the octagon with the uh, split decision win in five rounds. That was an unbelievable war. TJ is the man. He's coming on. Right after that, we got the country music hit maker, Rodney Atkins, Farmer's Daughter. Dad, I want to be like you. Going through hell. Keep on going. I'll just sit here and keep on cleaning this gun. Rodney Atkins is coming on. And right after that, who do we got coming on this life ain't for everybody? Uncle frickin' Ted. Ted Nugent will be coming on the show today. But that's another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody brought to you today with Patrick McKinney from Life Spice. The Provider Life, theproviderlife.com. Check out our dry rubs. You heard about all 10 of them today. Get the ultimate pack. Go all in, and it's out retailers all over the country. Big R's, Ace Hardware, Murdoch, Sportsman's Warehouse, Max Prairie Wings. We're we're in uh, at Presley's in Illinois, in Peoria, Illinois. It keeps growing. We're over in the West Coast or the East Coast in Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland. We're growing. The Provider Life is here to stay. The episode today was also brought to you by our friends and family, Jack Daniels, Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey. Enjoy it responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. Tom, Jake, hit that button. This song is called What You Gonna Do When the Money's All Gone by the one and only Leith Lofton. I'd rather be poor living off in a hole Rich as hell without a soul Life on 